Good morning, good morning. You guys can be seated. It's so good to see you. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Journey, and it's my great privilege to be the pastor here at Discover Church. Give yourselves a round of applause for navigating the weather, making it in today. Uh, my house is a house divided. I love this weather to drive in. Uh, it's an excuse to go have fun. Anybody else in the room was like, come on, bring on the snow. I'll just go out by myself and, and just have some fun. Anybody in the house where it's like, oh dear Lord, I am not gonna drive on this ridiculous weather. Anybody like that? Yeah, yeah. My wife hates riding with me. Uh, she's constantly telling me to slow down. I'm like, babe, I haven't taken out a park yet. We're, you know, we're, <laughs> we'll be all right. Anyway, so good to see you. We are in week two of a series that we have called Focus. And last week, if you missed it, we introduced this word focus as a theme for our church. It's a theme that, that we're going to be kind of, kind of falling back on uh, throughout the year. And it's something that um, I, I just feel like God has, has put this word on, on my heart for our church for this year. And what we talked about last week is we, we introduced this verse that, that's going to be kind of a, uh, an anchor point for us uh, for, for not just this series, but for, for the year. And it's something that at different times in the year we're going to be coming back to because we, what we learned last week is God has this remarkable promise that's packed into Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, but it comes with some prerequisites. So I want to take us back to Proverbs chapter 3, just as kind of our jumping off point to the message today, uh, and then I'll kind of lead us where God is leading us uh, for, for the message today. So Proverbs chapter 3, if you can get those verses on the screen, please, it says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, but in your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. Man, last week was so life-giving, and I hope it was encouraging to you as we learned exactly what it meant for God to direct our paths, that he makes it good. If you missed it last week, go back and watch it. We don't, I'm not going to preach it again for you. But here's the deal. As I mentioned last week, this is really kind of an interesting series because it's a, it's a series where I believe that God is directing us to his word and directing us to some things that's not about any one of us individually. It's really, really not about you. It's not really about me, but it's about us. It's about what God is doing and what God wants to do in and through us as a church. And if you're new with us, man, you've picked a great time to come and spend some time with us because we're going to be unpacking where God is leading us for the next year. Um, and so you're going to get an opportunity to learn a little bit about us and see where we're going and kind of make the decision about whether or not you want to be a part of that. And, and if you're, you're new to the idea of faith and, and, if, and if you're not even convinced about this whole Jesus thing, man, I just consider it a great privilege that you would come and spend some of your Sunday with us. And I'm glad that you're here. And my hope is, is that you will see that there is something to this Jesus. Um, and he's not just, um, he's not just hype. And so we're going to jump into this today. Uh, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 10. So if you have your Bibles, go up to Luke chapter 10. Um, and as we dive into this, God is going to be really kind of revealing uh, two of our four major initiatives for the year. I mean, I'm going to be revealing two of those to us today that I believe God has, ha, has a heart for and a desire for not just for us as a church, but for our community um, and what God has in store for us. And, and so I've titled today's message, Too Busy to be Blessed. Let me ask you this question just to consider it as we jump off today. Are you too busy to be blessed? Are you so busy that you wouldn't even know a blessing if it came to your front door? I'm convinced that we live in a day and age that, that we're all too busy at some level to be blessed. But I believe that God has something incredibly life-giving and has some powerful truths for us today in his word. We're going to start in Luke chapter 10. If you're with me this morning, if you've got your Bibles open or turned on or whatever you do to get ready, let me hear you say, Chiefs, Chiefs. come on, dear Lord, I pray that we would remove all hope and we would take away all joy from any fan of the team that roots against us. <laughs> May there be no mercy. May grace be distant from them. But may we do it in a loving Christ-like way. Amen. <laughs> amen. 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 Luke chapter 10 this morning. We're going to dive in. It says this. Now it happened that as they went, and he, that's Jesus, entered a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called 
Mary. Now, who is Martha and Mary? We meet Martha and Mary a couple different times in the account of Jesus's life in what's called the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the first four books of the New Testament. And we, we, we come across them a couple different times, and they were, they were part of this group of people that, that had really begun to follow and, and lean into the teachings of Jesus. Jesus had burst onto the scene, and he was upsetting the apple cart of everything that was normal, everything that was accepted, everything that was okay. The religious leaders didn't really know what to do with him because he spent more time with, with sinners than he did with the, the spiritual people, and they didn't know what to do with him. And the, and the, the sinners and the, and the poor and the lowly uh, were so excited because finally they had somebody that seemed to be an advocate for them. Uh, this was a part of the world in Israel where they were, they were under the rule, the iron fist of the Roman Empire. And their, their leaders, the religious leaders called Pharisees and Sadducees, um, they were, they were the, the religious leaders of their day. And, and they were oftentimes um, all too concerned about their own self-interest to, than, than, than to advocate for the people that they should be uh, representing and, and, and trying to lead and, and trying to take care of. And Jesus came onto the scene, and he began proclaiming these messages that were, that were totally revolutionary, messages of, of hope to the captives and, and freedom for those in bondage. And, and he talked about overthrowing the empire. And, and what Mary and Martha would have known is that they would have known that, that their, um, their scriptures, their holy scriptures, talked of a day where there was going to be a rescuer, where God was going to send a rescuer to rescue his people, which was the nation of Israel. And these scriptures promised that this rescuer was going to come and he was going, to, he was going to, to take care of God's people and take care of the Israelites and take care of the Jewish people. And most of these people, uh, most of the, the Jewish people believed that this rescuer was going to come uh, in some type of way of power and overthrow the government and, and, a, and entire, set up an entirely new system. But when Jesus came onto the scene, he did it very, very differently. Mary and Martha would have been like a lot of the people um, who, who were intrigued and interested and chose to follow Jesus, that, that a lot of them were, were kind of oppressed. They didn't have much. They had little influence and they had little voice. And so Mary and Martha began to, to hear about this Jesus and hear about the things that he was saying and how he would talk about the scriptures in a way that nobody else talked about them. The, the Bible tells us that when Jesus talked about the scriptures, your Old Testament, that he would do so with authority unlike any other. And not only that, he would begin to perform these miracles where, where, where water was turned into wine and, and people were, who were deaf were able to hear and people who were lame from birth were able to, to get up and walk and all of these things. And Mary and Martha had heard about Jesus and they had come to the conclusion that this Jesus of Bethlehem must be the rescuer that God promised in the scriptures. And so Jesus shows up to their house and as you can imagine, it's a little bit of pandemonium. Now, I want you to think about, I want to do a little bit of work today to try to place us in the story so that we can kind of understand Mary and Martha's perspective about the story today. And I want you to imagine or think about what, happened, uh, what happens in your house when somebody calls, maybe it's a, a, a friend or, or, or somebody else, I don't know, and it says, hey, uh, can I stop by in a few minutes? And you look around the house and go, how many is a few? I say, I'll be there in six minutes. Come on by, we're ready and waiting. As soon as click, it's like General MacArthur meets General Patton. Get off the couch and get your stuff cleaned up and clean up the room and move, 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 go, 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 right? Like it's, it's sheer chaos and pandemonium. And then, and then they pull into the parking lot and you're like, all right, now be quiet and relax. Be cool. So good to see you. Oh, we're just laying around doing nothing. What are you doing? Oh, come on in. Come on in. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like you know what that's like when somebody shows up to your house and, 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 and kind of unexpected. But if you had time to prepare for it, like, if you know that next Saturday you're hosting people over to your house, then you've got a whole week to get ready. You've got a week to go grocery shopping and, and, and get the house ready and clean the house and, and get the dishes ready and do all the cooking, right? right? So, so this is the thing. Like, Jesus is, is the guy. He, he's the one that Mary and Martha believe are the, is the great promised rescuer. The, the scriptures called him the Messiah that was going to rescue the Jewish people out of this tyranny and out of this overwhelming oppression. 
And so Mary and Martha, they've been getting ready to host Jesus. And Jesus shows up to their house, and I want you to notice what Mary does. It says, Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. So Jesus comes to the door, and, 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 and like they've been scrambling, they've been working, right? And Jesus shows up. He's like, oh, Jesus, come on in. Do you, what do you, you're, you're, you're the Messiah. Do you sit or do you float? What do you do? I don't really know, right? And they, and they welcome him into whatever their living space would have been. And Mary just sits down and starts talking to Jesus. Now, this was, this was significant because what Mary was doing was she was taking an advantage of an opportunity that was rarely ever afforded to women. That she was taking advantage of the opportunity to sit and learn and listen from a rabbi. Women were, were, were almost never given this opportunity back in the day because women didn't have a voice. Women didn't have influence. They, had no, they, they were seen as less than in the culture. It was very much a, a male-dominated society and a male-dominated culture. And I think it's significant that Jesus doesn't brush her away, but he welcomes it. And he begins to speak. We don't know what they were talking about. But whatever it is, Mary just sits down and she's like taking notes. What's Martha doing? Well, it, it tells us verse 40. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him, that's Jesus, and she said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to get up off of her rusty, dusty, and help me. Now, you know what this feels like. You, you know exactly what Martha is feeling in this moment. Because if you are married, if you've ever had a roommate, if you have children old enough to help with chores around the house, you know what Martha is thinking. And they are not godly thoughts. You're, 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 you're busting your tail and you're all over the house and you're cleaning and, and you're prepping and you're folding clothes and you're whatever, whatever. You're doing all of it. And there they sit on their fat, happy bottom, watching the game, watching their favorite show, the eighth episode that they've streamed and binged since you've been cleaning, or they're on Instagram and every time you walk by them, your, your heart rate just goes up two ticks. Yeah, yeah. how many of y'all know what this feeling is? Yeah, I don't really know what this feeling is. <laughs> I really don't. I'm being honest. I'm usually the one that's causing this feeling, just true confession, okay? And Martha, she's done ticked. I mean, she, they have been working, they have been serving, all of a sudden the most important person that has ever, they've ever heard of, that they've ever met, has come to their house. Like, I don't know what that looks like for you, but think of the most important person that you can imagine. They have now walked into your house, and you are, you are doing the last thing. You're, you're finishing up the meals, and you're setting the table, and there they sit, just sitting on their fat bottom, just, uh-huh, hi, Jesus, how you doing? Just talking, just chilling. You just working. How you doing? Yeah, I'm talking to Jesus. I don't care what you're doing. And so Martha gets upset, and I just I can just I can picture it. She's over there working in the kitchen. And she, I'm done. I've had it. I'm not gonna sit here and take this no more. Just her apron, fixes her messy bun, takes a drink of coffee. And marches herself into the living room and says, Jesus, for the love of you, I love you, would you please tell my sorry excuse for a sister to get up off her rear end? I know you made her and I know you love her, but I don't right now. Would you tell her to get up off her bottom and get to work? She's all kinds of flustered and irritated. Jesus responds in a way that's not at all what Martha expected. 
Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha. Now what you need to know is in scripture when you see that in dialogue that somebody says someone's name twice, this is like a um, this, is, this is like a talking them down. This is a, this is a, a, a phrasing of, of, in, of endurance. It's like, simmer down, Martha. Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Now, I imagine in this very moment, Martha is like, I hear what you're saying, Jesus, but it's not what I want you to say. Some of us do that in our prayer life. I hear what you're saying, God, but it's not what I want you to say. You see, Jesus says, Martha, you're troubled and you're worried and you're wrestling through so many things. And, and here's the deal. I believe that, that part of this message is for somebody that's here today that, that you feel that God is distant from you. That maybe you started the beginning of the year and your resolution was to read your Bible more and to pray some more. And, and so you've been praying and you've been reading and you don't feel like your prayers are getting past the ceiling fan. Or maybe you've been opening your Bible and you've been reading and, it's, and, 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 and there's nothing coming from it. I believe that God has a message today for the person that's here that wrestles and struggles with anxiety. And I know there's a lot of you that are here. There's a lot of people in our culture, in our society, and there's a lot of us that, that struggle and deal with anxiety. You see, Jesus is saying, listen, Martha, you're all anxious about stuff. Believe what Jesus is saying is, listen, you're, Martha, you're so busy doing and doing and doing all of the things. Because you believe in doing all of the things, you'll satisfy the emptiness on the inside. You're attempting to meet everyone's expectations. And yes, there are some people, Martha, who have expectations of you, but you need to understand, Martha, that so many of the expectations that you're trying to meet are expectations that you have created for yourself. Or they are expectations that you perceive or you think that other people have of you. And you're trying to be the perfect woman. You're trying to, to be the perfect spouse. You're trying to be the perfect mom. You're trying to be the perfect uh, boss or employee. You're the perfect teacher. You're, you're, you're trying to have the perfect physique. You're trying to have the perfect house. You're trying to, to make it so that everything on Instagram looks absolutely perfect. And, and you're trying to match up your actual life with the highlight reel of what you put up on Instagram, what you, what you show everyone else to see. And so you create these expectations and you keep working and you keep doing and you keep working and you keep doing and you're working yourself crazy. You have made yourself anxious with all of the things that you're doing. And what you don't even realize is that as you are trying to live up to some expectation that you are creating for yourself based on your observation of someone else's life, someone who's wired different than you are, someone who's married to somebody who's different than you are, somebody who has kids who are different than yours are, and you are trying to live up to this perfect expectation that you are creating as you live in a state of comparison of your life against everyone else. But Martha, don't you know, if I wanted you to be them, you would be. And so you're busy, busy, busy. And in all of your busyness and in all of your work and in all of your effort, you're just making yourself more and more and more anxious. Martha, listen, girl, you are too busy to be blessed. You don't even recognize that the blessing has walked into your living room and you're too busy to even notice. Martha, who told you that the key to satisfy that longing in your soul is by your effort and by your work? As long as you continue to live this way, 
You'll never know how to make the most out of who you were created to be or begin living in the fullness of the life that God has created you to live in. So stop focus on focusing all of your effort on doing, doing, doing all of the things. Instead, Martha, won't you just focus your focus on me? Won't you focus your effort away from, from all of the things and focus your heart, focus your energy, focus your eyes, focus your goals, focus your resolutions on me. You see, Martha and Mary had two very different focuses. Martha's focus was on doing a dinner for Jesus. Because of that, when Jesus walks into the room and, and she's busy and she's trying to make sure everything is right and everything is just perfect and she's doing all this stuff and, and, and she realizes, man, I'm the only one doing this. Where's Mary? Mary has a very different focus. Mary's focus was on being with Jesus. What I believe that God wants you to see today and what, what, what God has been showing me this week as I've been praying and preparing is that this difference between doing for and being with is so subtle but so drastically different. I want to help you see what the difference is. The difference between doing for and being with, as we, as we work this out, as we see some different ways that it works itself to, to contrast the two, that doing for is ultimately what religion is. Doing for us is, 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 is what religion is all about. And, and the message of religion, the message of, uh, of religion says, hey, just, just do the things and say the catechisms and go through, uh, you know, uh, a discipleship course and, and get baptized and, and all of these things. If you'll just do all the right things, if you'll say the right amount of, of prayers, if you say them just the right way, and if you read your Bible just enough, if you'll do, do, do just enough, then you will finally reach what it is that you're longing for. But being with that says it's not about religion at all. It's about just relationship. It's about having a relationship with Jesus who did all of the things that's required of us so that they're no longer required of us to do them. But now our focus is not on doing, doing, doing all of the things to try to satisfy some expectation, but now the focus can be on just being in relationship, being close to Jesus, the one who did all of the things that is required of us so that we can receive the blessing of have the, having the innermost parts of our soul satisfied by God. You say, yeah, but, but aren't there, isn't there stuff to do, though? Like when I read the Bible, it seems like there's a whole lot of things that I'm supposed to do. And you're right. There are a lot of things that still require action, but I want you to see the distinctive difference. That if our focus is on doing for, if the focus is on a religious mindset, then here's what happens. All of those expectations, all of those action steps will feel like they are things that we have to do out of duty and obligation. I'm supposed to do them. I've got to do them. When, 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 you know, when, when I'm up here preaching God's word, when the Holy Spirit begins speaking into your heart about something that you need to start, stop, or continue, and you go, well, great, another expectation, another impossible standard, another thing that I can never meet. I already feel overwhelmed. Oh, my gosh, here we go. I guess I'll just do it again. But when your, focus is on, when your focus is on Jesus and just being with Jesus, then all of those action steps are something that is done out of delight. It's like the difference of upholding your marriage vows. I could tell you I have remained faithful to my wife because about 13 years ago, I stood in front of a church with a preacher man and I said, I do. And the only reason why I have stayed faithful is because at one point I gave my word. I don't care about her. I don't like her. I don't love her. I, I, I don't care about the condition of her heart or her soul. The only reason is because I have a duty and an obligation because I made a vow. And that's really all that matters to me. Or 
I can tell you that the reason why I remain faithful to my wife and the reason why I strive for purity in mine and purity in my eyes is because she wins my heart over and over and over again with her love and her service and her sacrifice and her affirmation and her encouragement and the, and the, the, the being and the presence and the embodiment of the Spirit of Christ that I see in her. And when I see that, I go, oh my gosh, what do I need to do? How can I help? How can I be a servant? How can I make sure that you know that my heart and my eyes and my body is yours and yours alone? Baby, I love you and it is my honor to do this. It's my delight. You see, that's the distinction. But if we keep running in the lane of the idea of doing for, here's the byproduct, and we saw it with Martha. With Martha, this is what it leads to. It leads to comparison. It leads to bitterness. It leads to frustration, and it leads to anxiety. Remember what Martha did. She was busy doing all of her stuff, and once she realized, I'm the only one over here doing all this stuff, where my sister at? She over there not doing anything. Immediately, there's comparison. Well, I'm working, and she's not. Right after comparison came bitterness. I, that kind of ticks me off a little bit. That bitterness led to frustration. Well, I'm really frustrated now. I'm going to come over. I'm going to say something. And all of it leads to anxiety. You see, that's where Martha was. That's why Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are busy and tied up. He's saying you're anxious about all of these things. And then, much to Martha's chagrin, Jesus then compares her to Mary and says, hey, listen, the only point of comparison here is the, the approach and the heart attitude that she has chosen to be with me. And what do we notice about Mary? She seems to be at peace. She's enjoying the privilege of being able to sit at the feet of a rabbi she has confidence. She ain't worried about what Martha's thinking. Girl, you keep, I don't know what you're doing. I don't know what you're talking. I ain't worried about it because I got my eyes on Jesus. And that's where my confidence, I'm not concerned about what you are saying to me. I'm not concerned about what you're saying about me. I'm not concerned about what you're subtweeting about me. I don't care what you said in that email. I don't care what you said to my boss. My confidence is in the one that I'm focusing on, which is Jesus, because what he says is the only thing that really matters to me. When we keep running down the lane of this idea of doing for, we ultimately find, we peel all the layers back, that at the heart of it is a deep concern about self. When we peel all the layers back about being with, then what we begin to find is that that, that self isn't really a part of the equation, that, that my heart is not bent and focused on my desires, my interests, my self-preservation or advancement, that, that my focus and my heart and my intent and the bend of my posture is about Jesus. And listen, I've made a lot of decisions in life. Some have worked out really well and some of them that haven't. But can I tell you something, that in the moments, in the seasons, in the positions and circumstances of life, when I have chosen to, to ignore the compulsion of doing for, because it's easier for me to understand doing for because it's tactile, it's tangible, it makes sense. There's cause and effect, and I can see it work, right? But remember what we talked about in Proverbs 3, that we lean not on our understanding. It's my understanding that when I do, and I do, and I do, it leads to this result, and I can understand understand that. But God is saying, listen, stop leaning on your understanding. Stop trying to focus all of your energy and effort on all the things that you can do for me. And instead, just focus your energy and effort on just being with me, realizing I've already done the stuff that you could never have done on your own anyway. And so, this this juxtaposition, this comparison of, of Martha who's focused on doing a dinner for Jesus. Jesus speaks to her and says, Martha, Martha, you're anxious about 
So many things. But Mary has chosen this one thing. She set her focus on the one thing that can never be taken from her. And it's me. And so as God has kind of led me down this road and God has been speaking to me about, about well, th- th- there's these things that I want to do in and through Discover Church. There's these things that I want to do in and through the Northland. God brought me to this text to kind of set this up, I believe, to help us receive this because I believe that there are two, there's many, but there are two significant areas in our lives, not just in our lives, but in the lives of everybody that lives in the Northland. That that we have adapted and we've bent and we've yielded to this mindset, to this idea of doing for something. And because it's created busy, 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 and we've missed out on the incredible blessing that God has in store for us. So what I want to do for the last few minutes together is I want to just, just kind of reveal to you and share with you where, where God is leading us as a church, these, these initiatives, two initiatives that God is leading us as a church to dive into for our sake and for the sake of those who are close to us but far from God. Because both of these issues are things that everybody that that is in this room and everybody that you know wishes the needle could move in a positive direction. And the first initiative is this. The first initiative for 2020 is to equip people to live with more margin in their lives. What is margin? Well, margin is, 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 margin is the space between your life and your limits. The limits being, this is all that I can handle, this is all that I can do, that's my limits, then here's where my life is. In the space that exists here, this is margin. But here's the problem. Most of us live overextended past our limits. And because we live overextended past our limits, we oftentimes feel rushed and frantic. Because we live past our limits, we we live margin-less. The result of it is that anxiety is more common than peace. Rushing is more common than resting, and debt is more common than savings. And the division that comes from us living without margin, the division becomes more prominent than unity. And so God is calling us as a church to dive in, to try to equip people to live with margin. What does this look like? How does a church do that? Well, we're going to have a a series that we're going to do. We're going to have a teaching series starting in February where we're going to focus in for six weeks on this idea of margin. And we're going to focus in on three specific areas. There's lots of places that we could dive into, but we're going to be diving into three specific areas. We're going to talk about how how do we live with margin in the area of our time? How do we live with margin in the area of our finances? And how do we live in margin in the areas of our heart? Because most of us have no margin, we feel like we never have enough time. Because we don't have margin, we're constantly in debt. And because we don't have margin in our heart, all we care about is ourselves. And it spews out of us and the things that we say on social media and with people and and, and the lack of, of care for our neighbor and the way that we look to take care of people. Not only are we going to do a teaching series, um, but Paul already talked about it today. We're launching over 20 small groups starting 1st of February, so that, so that we can equip people to, to put themselves in positions for the relationships that Paul was talking about earlier so that we can have some encouragement, so that we can have some championing, so that we can have people in our corner to help us understand what it looks like to live with the margin that God wants us to have. Of those 20-plus small groups, we're going to have three small groups that's going to be focused on, on our finances, We use a thing called Financial Peace University, and here's the deal. It's all about helping people, equipping people to make good decisions so that you can get your finances in order. People say, well, you know, I just want to be normal. Well, normal is broke. Literally, people are broke. 
So listen, we just want to put some resources in your hands. We want to give you opportunities to be able to know, man, how can I make better decisions? How can I be find financial peace? Because when I think of my finances, I think of financial ruin. I think of financial chaos. I think of a financial shackle around my neck. I think about all kinds of things, but peace is in one of them. If that's you, we're going to have three small groups that's going to be focusing on helping you find freedom, find peace in the way that you handle and deal with your finances. We're gonna be doing some other things as well over the course of the year to try to help and equip people to live with more margin. Why is this so important? Because it's in the margin where we experience the movement of God in our lives. And listen to me, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you don't believe in this whole God thing, listen, I get it. I don't care about, you know, you're like, I don't care about room for God to live in my life, that's fine. But would you like to have a little bit more peace in your life? Would you like to have a little bit more financial flexibility in your life? Would you like to not be so consumed with the burdens and the stuff of your own life that you can't think about anybody else, and because of that, you just feel like you're mad at the world? Then come on back. And if you are a follower of Jesus, can I tell you that I believe the devil of hell works like hell to prevent you and me from having margin so that we are too busy to be blessed by God. So our first initiative to equip people to live with more margin in their lives. The second initiative that we're going to be about in 2020 is we want to equip people to have happier, healthier, and godlier marriages. Here's what I know. Everybody in the room uh, most likely is either married or wants to be married. There's a small demographic you're like, I'm done with that. I ain't about it. That's okay. But maybe you know somebody who either wants to be married, who is married, and wishes their married was their married, their marriage was better. And so here's what we're gonna be doing. In the fall, we're gonna do a teaching series where we focus in on this and lean into, man, how can we have happier and healthier and more godly marriages? We're gonna have a host of small groups that are gonna be specifically and exclusively focused on marriage enrichment. I'm not talking about like just, you know, go and hang out and have a meal with some people and there are small groups for that. And I think it's awesome. I'm talking about nuts and bolts small groups led by people who have happy, healthy, godly marriages, not perfect marriages, but happy, healthy, godly marriages whose passion is to equip other people's marriages to be happier or healthier or more godly. Not only that, we're going to be releasing and putting out all kinds of resources and connecting things and putting things in your hand so that you can go about the business of having a happier, healthier, and godlier marriage. But here's what I believe. In both of these two things, in both our margin and in our marriages, I believe these are key initiatives for us because our instinct, our, our first step out of the gate is oftentimes to do something about it, to do something for it, to make it better. And I think it's because we have that instinct that we oftentimes feel like we're on a hamster wheel where we start again and get frustrated again. We get disappointed again, exhausted again. We lose hope again. But I believe that God has some profound things to teach us from his word about our lives and how to have more margin and about our marriages, about how to prepare to be a better spouse. If you're single and you want to be married, that God has things to say to you. If you're married and you want your marriage to be better, I believe God has things to say to you. And these are life-giving things that will be a breath of fresh air to your life. It'll be a breath of fresh air to your marriage and not just to us, but for the entire community, for the entire Northland. Because every person who's not currently sitting in church across our city has serious questions. Some are really big questions that, that I don't know that anybody will ever have all the answers to, but some of them are really practical questions. And what I know is that God has something to say about it. 
And so God is calling us to lean in, to equip people to have more margin, to lean in, to equip people to have happier, healthier, and godlier marriages. And here's the deal. If you're in the room and you are a follower of Jesus, can I tell you that those who are still unconvinced about Jesus are looking at your life. Not from the perspective of, do they have the Bible memorized? Not from the perspective of, do they have all the answers to all of my questions? Although I'm sure they do have questions and they get frustrated sometimes at some of the answers that don't satisfy. But listen to me. They are looking at your life and they're looking at my life. And they're asking themselves the question, if Jesus is really as significant to them as they say he is, then how is their life any different? I believe God is calling us as a church to grow in the area of margin, to grow in having happier, healthier, godlier marriages, because there are people that are close to us but far from God that are looking for an excuse to believe in the hope that Jesus offers. And it may just be that your life and the way that you live it and your marriage and how much happiness and vitality exists in your marriage is the thing that they're watching. That if Jesus can move the needle for you, then maybe Jesus can move the needle for them. And man, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, you don't know Jesus, you're not sure about this whole Jesus thing, man, I'm so glad that you came, even on a day where there's crazy weather like this. Can I tell you that the most life-giving thing that God ever did is when he looked down upon humanity with compassion, not condemnation, not conviction, but compassion. And then he sent his son from heaven to earth to do all of the things that you can't do and that I can't do to satisfy the anger of God for all of the things that we do wrong. So that anyone who believes in Jesus would not die, but have everlasting life. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus and you don't know what everlasting life is, I can't think of a better time than now and a better day than today. For you to just trust in him. To stop putting up walls and to stop running away and just say, Jesus, here I am. A whole room of people just saying a little bit earlier, nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. Jesus, I just want you. I don't know if you are all that, Jesus, but here I am and I... I know that what I've been doing hasn't been yielding anything that's very satisfying to the inner longings of my soul. So I want to give you an opportunity today to respond to Jesus. If you're part of our church, here's what I'm asking you to do. I'm asking you to pray for these two initiatives. We're going to be revealing another initiative next week and another one the week after. Would you be praying about this? Would you begin asking God now, God, would you show me where you want to work in the area of margin in my life? Would you show me where you want to work in my marriage or in my process of preparing to find somebody to be married? God, would you show up and speak and move in my life? And if you don't know Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to him. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me?